Hi, welcome. It's great to see you. Um, lockdown means a change of circumstances. We're not in the chapel anymore. We're in a room in my house. Um, but uh, it's it's good to be able to uh, open up God's word with you. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, come conscious of your greatness, your goodness, conscious of our smallness, our inadequacy, our weakness, our failings and our sin. We humble ourselves before you. We ask your help so that we could worship you as we should, that we would hear you speaking as we long to, uh, that you would be at work in us by your word and your spirit, that you would get all the glory here now. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, sing together now. Our words will come up on the screen and uh, there'll be a recording of uh, a congregation singing. Uh, we'll sing along uh, with praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Well, if you have a Bible, please uh, turn with me uh, to Luke's Gospel and chapter 14. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked him, if one of you is a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? They have nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honour at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honour. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he'll say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honoured in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbours. If you do, they may invite you back and so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. You will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who'd been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I've just got married so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. And the master told his servant, Go to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in, so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Large crowds were travelling with Jesus, and turning to them he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Would you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, This person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Would he first sit down and consider whether he's able, with 10,000 men, to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, 
he'll send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure heap. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Well, we're going to come now and pray in the Bible uh, we're commanded uh, to pray for those who are in authority over us for governments and for rulers so we're going to pray uh, particularly now uh, in that regard Heavenly Father we uh, pray to you we glorify you we honor you we praise you because you are god you are sovereign you rule over all we we look to you as our lord and as our god as our hope and our confidence as our certainty lord we uh, confess before you uh, that we have fallen short of you we've uh, gone our own way and ignored you we've put ourselves uh, at the center of the universe we confess this before you it is sin we ask your forgiveness and lord we pray for ourselves as a nation as a nation we have forgotten about you ignored you we humble ourselves before you and we pray your forgiveness lord we pray for our our nation we pray for our rulers now we pray for our Prime Minister Boris Johnson, sick at this time. We ask that you would uh, be gracious and uh, kind towards him, that he would be uh, restored and made whole. We pray for the uh, cabinet, cabinet, the rest of the government who will go on uh, leading us. Um, even at this time, Father, we uh, ask that you would uh, help them to rule wisely, well, that they would uh, show a great concern and uh, care for the the vulnerable that they would uh, have wisdom they would be able to make these uh, awesome weighty decisions uh, that they must face so we pray you'd help them in this we pray lord god for doctors and for nurses uh, for cleaners and porters and all those in the uh, healthcare system Lord exposing themselves to, to danger and laboring to bring healing and wholeness and mercy to others Lord strengthen them and keep them we pray Father strengthen and keep us we pray keep us from fear keep us from anxiety keep us resting in you keep us looking to Jesus Pray, Father, you'd uh, speak to us in your word now and, and be so at work in us by your word that we would become more and more what you would have us be, more and more shaped and formed into the image of Jesus Christ. We pray this in his glorious name. Amen. Well, we're looking at this passage then uh, this morning in uh, Luke chapter 14. Uh, Jesus at dinner and uh, Jesus on the road uh, and on both occasions in both settings Jesus uh, confronts the people uh, that he that he's dealing with and Jesus um, unafraid to speak strongly to speak directly to challenge to rebuke Jesus not nice, not easy, not uh, uh, an easy person to have around the place. Jesus places demands on us because Jesus is the Son of God. And he asks uh, really here two questions. For those who are interested in the kingdom of God, those who want to come into his kingdom, he 
he's been speaking over the um, last couple of chapters about this radical uh, new life. A radical new life with uh, God at the very centre of it. And uh, the two questions that he confronts us with. Uh, the first half, uh, the, um, verses 1 to, to 24, really the questions being, we're faced with, are you humble? Are you humble? And in then the, the second part of the chapter, verse 25 and following, are you serious? Are you humble? Are you serious? So let's uh, look at those in, in that order. Firstly then, um, Jesus is asking this question, are you humble? Jesus is invited as a guest, uh, we see at the beginning of chapter 40. But by the time you, uh, you get to um, halfway through the chapter, it's clear that Jesus isn't merely the guest. In a greater sense, he's the host. He is the one who will uh, invite people to feast with him in the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus, the guest, the man, the ordinary one who receives hospitality. Jesus, the host, the one who invites us into fellowship with God himself. Jesus, man and God. But as Jesus comes into this house, um, he is, we are told, being carefully watched. He's been set up. There is a man in front of him uh, suffering from, well, the translation I read earlier describes it as an abnormal swelling of his body, a kind of edema, um, a fluid buildup in the body that's that's painful, that's debilitating, that's disfiguring, uh, that's really... Uh, awful for this this chap and and he's been put a front and center as far as the pharisees are concerned if uh, this kind of thing happens to you, you you'd be under god's judgment he's an outcast so what is he doing there in the middle of this um uh, meal of this important guy uh, right in front of jesus well he's been planted there he's been put there to cause trouble put there to raise uh, this problem and Jesus asks the question is it lawful is it right what should we do about this here's this guy he's suffering he's sick should we heal him today on the sabbath or not well, seven times in the gospels when uh, Jesus confronts uh, the Pharisees or Jesus is confronted over the matter of of healing people on on the sabbath is it lawful? What do you think we should do about this? You see the compassion of Jesus. Jesus, uh, with the man there in front of him, can't just leave him untouched, unhelped. The same compassion, the same love that moved the Son of God himself to take on human flesh, uh, to come to earth, uh, to live uh, and to die on the cross in order to rescue us, is the same love that compels the Son of God. To heal this man. And there uh, then is if to answer his own question, is it right to heal him? Jesus asks this question. Suppose you had a son, a child or an ox uh, that falls into a well. Uh, it's drowning. Well, wouldn't you pull it out? Well, of course you would. You'd rescue uh, an animal. You'd certainly rescue a son if it was drowning in water. And here's this man, he's overwhelmed with fluid uh, in his body he's drowning if you like in his own body shouldn't he be pulled out and they have no answer and then he moves on and he challenges them about the way they um they pick their seats challenges them about their attitude are you humble is the question he's asking them and basically what he says to them in this is they pick up the best seats for themselves as they choose a place of honour. If you lift yourselves up, be careful because you're going to be cast down. Jesus is taking a teaching that comes up for us repeatedly in the Bible. The letter of James uh, says this explicitly in these words, that God opposes the proud. But gives his grace, his undeserved kindness and favour and help to the humble. You see, we live in a society that places a premium on, on pride. That we should be proud of ourselves. 
proud of this and proud of that. But in the Bible, the word pride is almost always a negative thing. It is someone who's puffed up. It's someone who's got an elevated view of themselves. Why is that a problem? Why does Jesus' warning is that? Why does God have so much to say about this? Because pride is to deny our need of God. It is to dethrone him. It is to say, God, I've got this one. I don't need you for this. No, God opposes the proud. Can you imagine that? To have God opposed to you. God opposes the proud. We ought to tremble if God was against us. If we tremble about the things that go on in the world, if we're trembling about um, the coronavirus, how much more are we to tremble, to worry about the prospect of God being against us? He opposes the proud. But he gives grace, his free, his undeserved kindness and favour to the humble. And he, well, he goes on to illustrate it by telling this parable about a great a banquet. You see, the, the, when, uh, as he mentions uh, being repaid at the resurrection of the righteous, uh, one of the men at the table with him uh, says, well, uh, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. They're looking forward to the day when the Messiah would come. He'd set up a new rule, a new reign, and, um, and it would, it's kind of pictured by this great banquet, this great feasting. God's kingdom presented as a time of joy and plenty. And maybe we, because of our affluence, uh, hard, find it hard to grasp the significance uh, to, to have plenty, to have joy. We've, uh, until now, perhaps, lived in a world of plenty. But suddenly we live in a world where you can't buy pasta. And maybe suddenly the idea of this uh, feasting and joy and gathering together with the ones we love, maybe it becomes much more uh, meaningful, much more real to us at this time. Well, there's a man who's preparing a great banquet and he's invited a whole heap of people. And uh, the way it worked, you would send out an invitation. Um, and then at the time of the banquet, when everything was ready, you send out a, uh, uh, the servant to say, right, now's the time, come on in. And what they're doing here, these uh, guests who are invited and then declined to come, what they're doing is a terrible breach of hospitality. You just don't do that sort of thing. In our own setting, you know, if, if, uh, if you were invited to, uh, to a wedding or to a formal event, uh, the, the, the invitation comes through, it's all nicely printed, it's there on the kind of little gold embossed card and it says RSVP and you respond to say, yes, I, you know, I, I'd love to come. And uh, we don't then on the, the day of the, the banquet, the day of the wedding, whatever it is, well, I can't be bothered. Oh, I've got something else on. No, you would make every effort to be there, wouldn't it? It would be a terrible, um, it would be a terrible uh, insult, terrible ruinous if you just couldn't be bothered to turn up. And look at the excuses they bring. They're feeble excuses. Oh, I've bought a field. I must go and see it. Surely you would look at a field before you bought it. I've just bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going on my way to try them out. Well, you try them out before you buy them or you try them out tomorrow. But I've just got married. I can't come. You knew you were getting married. You can bring your wife. No, they're feeble excuses. In uh, chapter 13, uh, we learned about those who were, um, who missed out. And we were warned about um, not missing the moment. And here, these people are missing out, not because they've put things off, not because it's uh, too late for them. Uh, but because they're just disinterested. And they're self-absorbed. And their priorities are all wrong. And perhaps in the context they're just, 
They're just proud. They've missed out. So what then? So when they won't come in, when they reject the offer, the invitation goes out to the unloved, to the unlikely. And they do come in. The streets and the alleys, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. The gospel being, the good news be, of Jesus being rejected by the Pharisees, by the religious types, by the proud ones. And it goes to the outsiders and to the, uh, the Gentiles. There's a wonderful breadth of Jesus' invitation. There are people who think they don't need to come and they don't come. But those who are humble... Those who know they have nothing to offer to God. Those who know they need God uh, to be at work in them. They need God's salvation. They are the ones who are made most welcome. God is opposed to the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Why? Because the humble know they need it. Because the humble are longing for it. So he... This is at the heart of what it is to be a Christian. This humbling ourselves and receiving God's gracious invitation. The Christian is aware of their need to be right with God. The Christian is aware that they cannot do a single thing about it themselves. They're aware that Jesus by his death on the cross has done everything that is needed. And therefore there's no place for pride among Christians. Amongst those looking in faith to Jesus. Rather there's a, a humility there. A Christian is those who know that they need Jesus to save them. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Well, the other um, section here, the next question Jesus asks, Are you serious? Are you serious? Because uh, he's travelling along with a crowd. Large tra crowds, verse 24, we're told, are travelling with Jesus. I know you're with him. I know you're kind of travelling along with him. I know you're a bit interested. I mean, you're listening right now. I, I presume you're a bit interested. But are you following him? Are you really with him? You see, Jesus, see, we're told he's travelling with them. And then suddenly he turns to them. You can imagine this crowd and suddenly they're stopped. Because Jesus has turned around and he's speaking to them. He stops them in their tracks and he confronts them. And notice uh, what it is he says to them. It's a strange thing, isn't it? But really what he's asking them is, are you serious? He says, you need to, um, if you're coming after me, and you need to hate your father and your mother, your wife and your children, your brother and your sisters, and even your own life. If you don't do that, you can't be my disciple. And if you don't carry your cross, you can't be my disciple. And if you're going to build a tower, you sit down and work out if you can afford it. If you're going to go to war, you work out if you're going to win. What's he, what's he saying? What he's saying that following me is costly. You need to weigh it up. What about this thing of hating the family? Jesus, telling people to hate the family, that's odd, isn't it? It's outrageous. I mean, elsewhere, Jesus tells us we're to love our neighbour, in fact, he even tells us we're to love our enemies. So how much more um, are we to love our family? So what on earth does this mean? Well, it can't mean that we hate uh, our family. No, this is a kind of hyperbolic speech. It's a, a type of speech that was uh, kind of common in Hebrew. Where to, to hate, in this sense, is, is, to, is to love something less. In other words, by contrast to the love that the Christian is to have for God, the putting of him first, it would almost seem like you hated your family. We can't make that clash with the instruction elsewhere to, to love our neighbour. Uh, the instructions to, to um, love wives, to uh, care uh, for children, to honour parents but this is the seriousness of it it is as if you hated them because of the love you would display towards God you're going to take up your cross he says 
Jesus had said this uh, before with the only this gospel. The cross, the image of execution, of humiliation, of, of total destruction, of, of giving yourself up entirely. To be prepared to give all. And many of the people, the first readers of Luke's gospel, those in the early church, would know all about this. Many of them did give up their own lives. Some of them did go to the cross. Many around the world do, even today. It is costly. You need to weigh it up. Then he uses the image of building. I'm halfway through a, a bunch of, of, of building DIY projects on the house. If you start them, you wonder if you can ever get to finish them. Well, he pictures a man who's building a tower. Why would you build a tower? Because there's a problem, because you need to guard something. Maybe it's a watchtower in your vineyard, whatever it is. But he's saying you would, you would make sure before you started it that you could finish it. You wouldn't rush in without thinking it through. You would weigh it up. This is going to be costly. Uh, the same is true of the king going to war. You would stop and think about this. You weigh it up. Weigh it up. It's costly to follow Jesus. If you don't give up everything, you can't be my disciples, says Jesus. Strong words. Heavy words. We need to take them seriously. We need to examine ourselves in the light of them. Are you serious? You need to be salt, he says at the end. If it loses its saltiness, uh, you need to be distinctive. It loses the thing that makes it what it is. It isn't anything. And the Christian is to be distinctive and they're giving up everything in order to follow Jesus. And that following of Jesus, that dedicated life, is what makes us what we are. It is the mark of being Christians. If it doesn't taste salty, it ain't salt. If we're not following in this costly, all-pervading way that cuts across every aspect of life, then we're not following. Jesus is laying down a challenge. How far are you going to go? How serious are you? To be a follower of Jesus is no light thing. It is costly. You need to weigh it up. Friends, when you weigh it up, let me tell you, he is worth it. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So these are the two questions that Jesus asks. Two questions I want you to ask yourself. Are you humble? Are you serious? Heavenly Father, I pray that by your uh, working of the Holy Spirit in us, you would... Uh, shine that light into our very hearts so that we could examine ourselves properly that we would know that we would see our right relationship to Jesus and we would throw ourselves on him I pray in his good name amen now we'll close uh, by singing a hymn together when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died Well, I'll close by saying the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.